So our first speaker uh, of the afternoon is Ms. Leslie Wistrom. Leslie is the Patient Relations Manager for Griffles Canada. Leslie's role is to develop and maintain partnerships with key patient organizations in order to educate them about plasma therapies and support patient-focused activities. Please welcome Leslie Wichstrom. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I've already had a request that since this is the, uh, the first slot after lunch to try and make this as interesting and energetic as possible, so I'll do my best. So thank you very much, Angela. And um, I'd like to start today. Oh, I'm going to have the same problem as Dr. Chapman, maybe. Ah, there we go. Um, uh, my presentation is going to segue very well into Dr. Chapman's today. As we know, Dr. Chapman spoke quite a bit about augmentation therapy. And the basement basis of augmentation therapy is blood plasma. Griffles is primarily devoted to plasma-derived therapies used to treat a number of rare diseases, including alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And Griffles' plasma philosophy is a commitment to donor health and the safety of our plasma products. And you're going to hear me say that many times over the next uh, little while as we go through the presentation. So what is plasma? Well, plasma can best be described as the liquid portion of the blood that contains the proteins, enzymes, and antibodies that allow most of our bodily functions to work. There are other very important parts of blood, of course, like red blood cells. But for us, we're really focused on the plasma as it contains the proteins that we can extract and use in the medicines that we manufacture. And as you can see from the... Um, the display up here, the proteins are a very, very small portion of, a, of the blood, just 7% there. And you can see the alpha um, beta globulins are just 21% of that 7%. And I need to be more in front of the podium, <laughs> sorry. So now that we know what the plasma is and where the proteins are, we need to actually collect that plasma. And that's done through a process called plasmapheresis. And technically speaking, it's kind of a complicated process, but from a conceptual process, it's quite easy to explain. We all know how, to make a, how we make a whole blood donation, where we go and donate blood, and it goes into a bag. But with plasmapheresis, the blood is collected and pulled into a machine. And the machine separates the plasma from the red blood cells. It maintains the plasma within the machine, and it gives the donor back their red blood cells. And this is very important because it allows the donor to donate plasma on a much more regular basis than, if we donate, than when we donate whole blood because it takes the body a much longer period of time to regenerate red blood cells than it does to re regenerate the proteins in the plasma. I think there's <laughs> another party going on next door. Um, <laughs> Um, so Griffel's donor centers must be strictly regulated. Um, they must meet safety and quality guidelines that are uh, put in place by organizations like the FDA, because the plasma do donation centers do exist in the United States, and then Canadian health agencies as well, because the plasma, of course, comes up to Canada in the form of therapies to be used by Canadian patients. Additionally, um, Plasma organizations such as Griffles and other plasma companies work together to provide standards for plasma donation and plasma fractionation that include things such as community health standards, the concept of the qualified donor, nucleic acid amplification technology or NAT testing, and a required inventory hold. And I'm going to talk about more of those uh, concepts shortly. So to begin, it's very helpful to fully understand the plasma donation process so that you can really grasp the level of detail that goes into collecting the plasma and ensuring donor health and plasma safety. And the first step um, in the plasma donation process to understand is that Griffles relies on source plasma collected through the plasmapheresis process from repeat donors, sorry, this thing is a little weird, uh, from repeat donors, and we want them to be repeat qualified donors because that way their health is always being uh, monitored, 
for their own health as well as the safety of the plasma that they're donating. So prior to the use of a donor's plasma for the production of a therapy, the donor has already undergone a complete and thorough medical examination, two medical health history screenings, and two sets of infectious disease screenings. And these requirements result in what we call a qualified donor, who will hopefully be a repeat donor who comes and uh, becomes a committed donor, um, donating on a very regular basis. The plasma donation process starts with donor registration. And this step in the process is actually there to ensure that the donor is uh, a, uh, a member of the local community and that it is actually safe and suitable for that donor to make a donation. The process involves the verification of their ID and they must be able to prove that they have a local permanent address. And on top of that, and most importantly really of all, we also cross-check against something we call the National Database of Deferred Donors, which is an industry-wide database that um, the companies who collect plasma share their donor lists, so that if a donor is deferred for whatever reason from donating plasma at one organization, they can't just cross the street and donate at another one. They're added to the list, and, and all of the, the companies who participate in this program are aware of why they were deferred. Now that a donor has been registered, the next step is the medical assessment. And as I said earlier, this is a very comprehensive assessment that includes a physical examination, measurement of the donor's vital signs, as well as measurement of other very important uh, indi indicators of just general good health. And also, s we give the donors donor education so that when they leave, they're also um, conscious all the time of maintaining their own good health because, of course, as I said, we want them to return and be a, a committed return donor. And also, we inform them of the importance of the, of the plasma donation that they're making or, and, and what we do with that plasma and the medications that it goes into, including alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. <laughs> Clearly, this is not nearly as exciting as, <laughs> holy smoke. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep. At the back, yeah, okay. Yeah? Oh, the guy in the poster? That, yeah, so the guy in the poster has just arrived, clearly. <laughs> I'll try and compete. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, if we can add, you know, at the, I think a very important piece um, to this whole situation also is educating the donor about the importance of what they're doing. Because if they can attach a patient face and the patient experience to what they're going and, and doing, sometimes several times or a couple of times a week, then they will be committed and return donors for us. So in addition to the donor medical assessment that I spoke about, Plas plasma donors must also create what we call a personal health history questionnaire. And this is just one more step in the risk assessment profile that we're trying to build for a donor in order to uh, um, ass ass assure ourselves that the donor is suitable and appropriate to make a, a plasma donation. And I, I do want to point out that all of this is being done before they've even made their first donation to, to the organization. So the questionnaire asks specific questions about their medical health history, their travel history, social history, um, any symptoms of illness they might be feeling, as well as any medications they might be on. And assuming now that the donor has made it through the medical assessment, the physical exam, and that they've um, appropriately completed that personal health history questionnaire, they can actually move on to the donation process. So that donation process takes 60 to 90 minutes. It's a much longer process than donating whole blood because of that plasmapheresis process that I talked about where they receive their red blood cells back again. And during that time, the donor is very closely monitored by the medical center staff within the donor center just to ensure that they're healthy and that the donation is going smoothly. And the donor has to donate two times before their plasma is qualified for use um, in manufacturing. They can also donate twice in a seven-day period, but no more than that because it does take a little bit of time for the body to regenerate the proteins within the plasma. 
Donor Center Medical Oversight is managed by Donor Center Medical Directors, and they are responsible for ensuring the oversight, certification, and qualification of Donor Center uh, medical staff. And each, this it helps to ensure that each donor center uh, complies with the procedures to meet the quality assurance standards. And those standards, as I've already talked about, help us to maintain donor health and product safety. So where is the plasma collected? Well, in Griffles in the US, and this, um, this slide, oh, this slide has been updated. There are 160 donor centers collecting 26,000 donations every single day. So you can imagine the tight oversight that this requires in order for us to ensure that we comply with the regulation and the standards that I spoke about earlier on in the presentation. And there are also two testing laboratories in Texas where um, every single donation is tested, and I'll talk about that just now. And in addition to all of this, we have full traceability of the plasma throughout our, our system. So as soon as a donor walks through a donor center door, we can trace their donation right through to the manufacturer of a specific vial of, of treatment through a system that we call our pedigree system. So transportation and logistics. As you can well imagine, if we are collecting 25, 26,000 donations daily, that have to be kept and maintained at strict temperature controls. This is quite an undertaking. Following every donation, as I said, a sample of that donation is sent to one of the two testing centers in Texas. And the rest of the donation is uh, transported from the donation centers to our warehouses in temperature controlled tractor trailers or containers. And the plasma donations are held in inventory until the test results have been analyzed and that specific plasma donation has been released for manufacturing. Every donation from a new donor, so this is still going through this process to identify a qualified donor, every new donor, um, when they make their first donation, uh, they, they make that donation, and then they have to wait 60 days, and they make another donation. And during that 60-day window, we call it the window period. It allows us to address this period of concern. And the best way to describe the window period is, and we've all gone through this, you know when you think you're getting a cold? So you've got the sniffles or maybe a scratchy throat, and you're like, oh, is it a cold? Maybe it's, maybe it's allergies. You're not sure, but you still go around, and you're probably contagious in that time because a few days later you get a full-blown cold. But um, during that window, you weren't really sure. Well, the 60-day window period that, that I'm talking about here helps us address more serious types of infections because the last thing we want is for a donor to come in and make that initial donor and be a donation and be asymptomatic of some illness and then uh, pass through the, the registration process and actually make a donation. Um, and by waiting through that 60-day period, it gives us some time to address any illnesses that might come up through all of our testing processes. So once we have the donation, the next step is to test the plasma for uh, safety and quality. And as I mentioned, we have, this, this is I think a bit of an older slide, but there's 160 donor centers, 26,000 donations daily, and every donation is tested a minimum of 10 tests. So if you do that math, that's 52 million tests or more a year. Um, and again, this is done in these two testing centers in Texas. The state-of-the-art testing helps us to ensure the donor health and the safety of the plasma to be used in manufacturing. And this includes testing for pathogen and other donor health markers. So every donation, every single bottle that we collect is tested for HIV, hepatitis A, B, and C, and the B19 virus. And additionally, we have periodic testing related to liver function, serum protein, serum protein electrophoresis, blood cell antibodies, and syphilis. So that we maintain knowledge about the pathogens that we need to be 
aware of and new pathogens that we need to be concerned about. Griffles has developed uh, very close relationships and open lines of communication with leading health agencies around the world, such as the FDA and Health Canada. And the purpose of this is to have ongoing vi vigilance around the emergence and the development of new pathogens, and thereby giving us an opportunity to react quickly to anything should it, should it appear. And it's important to remember and to realize that every step that I've talked about today matters. Our mission every day is to ensure the safety of Griffles products from existing and potentially new and developing uh, pathogens. And with this mission, we are open and transparent about the risks associated with all plasma-derived products. The reality is that the products, Griffles products, are derived from human uh, plasma. And so no matter how many processes and how many regulations we follow to ensure our products are as safe as possible, and as safe as we can possibly manufacture them, there's always a very small risk of missing a new pathogen, an infectious agent or a virus, such as um, the kruschfeld Krush yakov disease, or mad cow from years ago, or even the possibility of unknown infectious agents. But as you can tell from the steps I've just walked you through today, we try to make this risk as low as technologically possible, maintaining and following every step to, to the T. So with that, uh, this does wrap up my presentation to you today, and I really appreciate having this opportunity to be able to describe that background process, and I hope it has tied together with uh, some of what Dr. Chapman was talking about this morning, and I appreciate your time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Leslie. Bob, do you have a question for Leslie? Yeah, sure. Is that okay? <laughs> Leslie, I've uh, toured one of the facilities in the States, mm -hmm. and it was really impressive, and I would recommend it for anybody that wants to see how this happens. But I didn't see any collection centers in Canada. Is there a reason for that? Yes. So right now there there are not uh, plasma collection centers. Um, the blood system in Canada is completely different and is managed by a reg two regulatory uh, bodies, national bodies, um, and that that is a discussion that's going on. But that would be managed and maintained through those blood systems. There, uh, Hema Quebec is here in Quebec, and Canadian Blood Services manages the other uh, donation centers. There's some industry changes happening, but not within Griffles. There's a lot of discussion about it right now. It's a hot topic. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yeah. Angela? Hi, Leslie. Hi. Uh, most of the plasma is collected in the States. Yes. So is the plasma is uh, control concerning the Trump syndrome? <laughs> That's the best question I've ever gotten. <laughs> We haven't, we haven't developed that test yet, but well, I'm sure they're on it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you. much.